Well, we are going back to the seven churches of Revelation, so we'll be in Revelation chapter 2 this morning, and just tracing through the words of Jesus Christ to these seven churches. Now, if you're visiting with us this morning, and you hear today's message, it may sound a little bit negative, okay? That's because these are the words that Jesus Christ is talking to a church that is messing up, okay? So do not think these are the pastor's words specifically for you. I mean, if the shoe fits, certainly wear it. But, <laughs> but as we preach through the Bible, we have to preach what the Bible says. This is to a specific people at a specific time, but we're going to see some very relevant truths that are being preached here and some cautions that we need to watch out for, okay? And that's why we're going to look at this. We're going to continue and what we're going to see in this church of Thyatira, as we open the Bible here in a minute, is they're listening to the wrong people. At least some of the people are listening to the wrong people, who are not leading them in the way of righteousness, they're not leading them in the way of truth, they're, rad- they're leading them the opposite direction. And that's a danger. If you were to go out into the wilderness, and you see berries growing, you probably want to know whether they're edible or not. If you have small children, like if I brought Matthew with me, who's two and a half, I would have to watch because he'd put anything in his mouth unless I was very vigilant to protect my children. Garrett, on the other hand, has this new obsession. Garrett's five. He wanted, it started this last summer. We don't know where it came from. Probably playing this video game we got, the Oregon Trail, the new edition. Some of you remember that on the old Apple in grade school, right? Oregon Trail. We got a new one for our regular laptop at home, it has new benefits. Like when you go foraging, you get to look up the items and say, do you want to keep it or not? And you can look up whether they're poisonous or not. Unfortunately for Garrett, he started this summer asking if everything was poisonous. We gave him yogurt and, you know, a grilled cheese sandwich. Mom, is this poisonous? Um, There have been times I've wanted to poison my children, but it's illegal, so... And parents, you know what I'm talking about. Don't sit there and go like, oh, what a horrible person. Um, <clears throat> so, but he's like, is this poisonous? If you're in, in the wilderness, that's a legitimate question. Hopefully, if your parents are preparing your food, you do not need to ask that question. Okay? Unfortunately, at this church, they had people serving them entrees that were not palatable. They were dangerous. We're not just talking about food poisoning. We're talking about severe danger to their spiritual health. And so as we look at how Thyatira is messing up, let's let it be a caution to us this morning and, and hope that we don't tread down the same path because the words that Jesus Christ has for this church are a little less than cordial. You may have this idea of how Jesus speaks. You know, like we've, we've talked about over and over, like, guys, please stop. This is not the Jesus Christ you see speaking to this church. He is not happy. (laughs) But let's see why. Let's read these words. We're starting in in chapter 18. I mean, uh, chapter 2, verse 18. Excuse me. And we're going to read through verse 29. I'll read this aloud. And then we'll go back and go through this verse by verse. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are even more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and to seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not known this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. 
but hold fast what you have till I come. And he that overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also have received from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Lord, we come before you and we ask that you would speak clearly to us. That we would hear your words. Not what we want to hear. Not what we think we should hear. But what you have to say to us through your word and to our hearts. And I pray you would give us the ability to receive that instruction and and to commit it. Not just to our mind, but to our behavior as well. And we pray that you would speak through the sermon this morning and be glorified in everything that is done here in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're looking at Thyatira, and we've been going through the seven churches of Revelation. It's a city, an ancient city. These were in the first century uh, AD. We've been going in order. Incidentally, it's clockwise, starting here in Ephesus. First church Jesus addresses in the book of Revelation is Ephesus, then Smyrna, and he goes up to Pergamum and kind of comes back clockwise in this flattened clock shape. But we're up here in Thyatira. Thyatira was not a notable city. I mean, it was an important city, but it wasn't a place to visit. Thyatira is a manufacturing town. While Ephesus had the seven wonders and, and great, great port city, um, Pergamum was a powerful city, Smyrna was an important city, Thyatira is where things are made. It's not on your list of vacation spots per se, but it is an important city to the empire. It was um, an important center of manufacture. They had dyeing, uh, garment making, pottery, and brass working. Okay, and and those are just some of the trades. Um, Today, there's still a large town there um, in modern-day Turkey. If you remember in the Bible, you remember, remember the person Lydia in the book of Acts, who Paul met in Philippi. Philippi, across the sea, he runs into her. She's a businesswoman. Uh, she was from Thyatira. She's basically probably in sales, we're guessing. She's off there from Thyatira selling purple cloth, which is what Thyatira was known for. There's still a a type of dye manufactured in this region called Turkish red. For those of you who know garments and know about Turkish red, I didn't know that until I did my background. But for those of you who do, that's the region of the world it still comes from. And But because of its industry, they had... In a sense, a very modern situation in Thyatira. And it was one of the first places it happened where they had unions. They didn't have the Teamsters, but they had trade guilds. And in order to be a part of the major manufacturing in Thyatira, and it was a big manufacturing town, you had to be a member of a trade guild. Some of you can relate to that. I remember when I worked for Par Electric in San Diego. Some of you were like, I didn't know you were an electrician. I wasn't. I was not an electrician. I'm afraid of electricity. Um, If it sparks, I call someone. But in order to even be on their traffic control team, as a worker of Par Electric, I had to go down and sign the books at the union shop. I said, I have to sign the books as an electrician to turn a sign. I said, pretty much that's it. No problem, right? That was not a conflict of of morals or anything. I said, I I can do that. Um, And so for nine months, I held those signs, as you see during construction here, stop. Slow, or stop, yeah, slow, stop slow. It's a very intellectually stimulating job. (laughs) Specifically made for someone of my ability, correct, right? But that's what they had. You had to sign the books if you wanted to work. Here's the problem. I don't know where you fall on the union thing, and really it's not relevant to the sermon. And there are issues that the Bible doesn't deal with specifically, but the unions here had a big problem. Almost all of them, because this is a polytheistic religious society, had a patron deity. So for you to join the guild, you basically had to say a pledge of allegiance to whatever god they wanted you to worship. So all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, I'm a believer in Christ. I believe there's one true God. There's one God. I only serve Jesus. I made an allegiance to him. 
I want to feed my family. They're saying I have to do this pledge of allegiance to some other God, which I know is not a God. What do I do? That's what this, these people in the city were really dealing with. On top of it, to make it even worse, it wasn't just like, hey, say hi to this little deity. They would have big festivals for their guild memberships throughout the year. And these festivals to these pagan deities were largely, maybe not in every instance, accompanied with every kind of debauchery you can imagine. And so you would be like, you have to come if you're a member of the guild. We're celebrating our God. And there are going to be all sorts of immorality going on at these festivals. And you are expected to participate. They had this weird thing in the ancient world. In a lot of temples, and we've seen this, this happened in Palestine as well. We'll talk about this a little bit more. They would have cultic prostitutes. So basically they have these people working at these temples that by your means of worship, you go and partake in prostitution, give your money to the temple. It's, it's kind of like a very licentious bingo. Okay? You know, some, for those of you who grew up in a, where they had churches and you could play bingo, this is taking it several steps way beyond that. And so what we have going on, this church is dealing with a very difficult situation, saying we want to feed our families, we want to reach our neighbors, but we are expected to be part of something that is very contrary to the faith. So you can see how it would be a difficult town to be a believer in. Um, and we start off, so we already started talking about the church of Thyatira. And Jesus Christ is addressing the specific people at the specific time. Now for those of you who think this is symbolic of another age, people would normally would assign this to the medieval church um, up to the Reformation. However, we know these are real people and we know there are churches today that do make big compromises. And Jesus Christ knows, as we just read, there's a woman there. He calls her Jezebel, probably not her real name, but to a reference back to the Old Testament, who is leading the people into sin. What she appears to be doing, as you read this over and over again, is saying, you know what? Jesus Christ knows you're going to follow him. So when you want to go to the part of these guilds, it's okay. Do your pledge of allegiance to the other gods. Whatever happens at the guild stays at the guild and then go back and be a Christian. It's okay to be immoral. It's okay to pray to this other god because that's what you got to do. And that's a message that she is giving. And like I said at the beginning, this is poison fair as far as God is concerned. This is a great departure from the faith. Not only is it blasphemy against God to be worshiping other gods in tandem, that's against commandments one and two and the Ten Commandments. This is not a new revelation. But it also will destroy their souls by partaking in the sin that is going on there. And so by the time he gets here to speak in this passage, he is not very happy. Now maybe you don't see this. It's... Um, Initially, it says, these things say the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. Okay. First of all, he calls himself the Son of God. He is the Son of God, so you say, why is this notable? Earlier in this book, he's been calling himself the Son of Man. He's been relating to other human beings, saying, look, I took on human flesh. I entered my own creation. Now he is saying the Son of God. This is his ranking title. To put it in our vernacular, Jesus Christ is pulling rank. I am the creator of the heaven and the earth, the very God Almighty. This is who is speaking to you. Do not think I am just another voice in the crowd. It is time to sit up in your chairs and listen. It's the Son of God. Who has eyes like fire. I've seen that from my wife on an occasion or two. <laughs> She's shaking her head, but it's true. Just once or twice. Like the time I told you about the story when she was on vacation that I told the boys didn't have to make their beds for a week. <laughs> not really. She, there were not eyes of fire, but I've been told I'm going to be used as an illustration at the sweet conference because of it. So, fair is fair. But we have sayings like that, don't we? When we say expressions today, like there's fire in her eyes. Husbands, is that really what you want to hear when you're going home? Probably not. Or you know, like, you know, if looks could kill, I'd be dead. And things like, uh, their hair is not the only thing on fire. You know, when you say somebody is riled up. 
Somebody is angry. And that is what's going on here. That Jesus Christ is coming there. His eyes are like fire because he is not happy. See, Jesus Christ cares about sin. It was our sins that nailed him to the cross. They're not little things. Does Jesus Christ love us? Absolutely. Does he take us where we are unconditionally? Because he paid for the sins. We can't atone for our own sins. It's impossible. How a sinner who is guilty can't atone for their own guilt, it doesn't work. But Jesus Christ is God's perfect son, being of infinite value, being of perfect morality and character, fulfilling the law to its completion, came, was taken to the cross, nailed to the cross for you and for me. So he responds in grace. Make no mistake about it. And he says, whoever will come can receive my grace, my love, be partnered with me in terms of my family. I'll prepare a place for you. You can be brought back to God. And like the, one of my favorite things to keep going back to in terms of quotes, it reminds me so much of the beginning of, of Les Mis, where the priest looks at Jean Valjean and says, Jean Valjean, I have bought you back for God. Jesus Christ did that. He took wretched human beings and he brought us back. But how, how much treason would it be if after he brought us in and cleaned us up and paid for everything we did and said, well, Jesus... Thanks a lot. I'm going to do everything I can in this life to oppose you. You'd really have to question the sincerity of the coming there, wouldn't you? So Jesus is not happy. Incidentally, his feet like bronze. Remember, they were bronze workers. When is, when is that feast like brass? You may say like blazing bronze, depending on your translation. It's when it's heated. That's when it glows. And we're going to see another picture in a minute. So his feet are on fire too. And incidentally, in a lot of commentaries will tell you, brass is often associated with judgment. Jesus Christ is coming and it is not good. It is indeed, wait till your father gets home moment right here. But before we get there, we do see the church has a lot going for it, okay? Unfortunately, the negative gets most of the time because it's a serious infection that needs to be dealt with. He says, look, you have works. I know your works. Love, service, faith, and your patience. And your works, the last are even more than the first. You're not getting tired. You're doing even more. You guys are loving and faithful. You're serving. You're patient in affliction. So there's some really good things about this church. And there's some really good people in this church. And he takes note of that. In fact, and all the churches in here, this is like the longest list of different things he's saying for good things. So they have some potential. And yet that potential is being undercut because they're tolerating this false prophetess. Last week we talked about Pergamum. Pergamum was a church that was beginning to compromise with the world. In Thyatira, they've taken it one step further. They're now letting people proclaim as teachers wrong instruction. It's not just people on the peripheral doing it anymore. It's people now teaching the wrong thing. And we read again, he says, says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. First of all, we see that Jesus Christ is definitely not okay with what she is proclaiming. We have to be very wise today about who we listen to. And that's why time and time again, all through this series, probably every sermon, at least once, you hear me say, you need to know this book. You need to know the Bible. You need to know Christ's word. Because I could be in error. Someone else could be in error. And it's your responsibility to hold God's words up and to say, I see that right here. It's the reasons we put the scripture up on the screen. And hopefully you bring your Bibles. That would be, it's allowed, by the way. Um, hopefully you bring them and open them up and follow along. But also, we put these up here because these are God's words. We don't want you coming to hear Troy's latest anecdote in philosophy for life. It would be a very, very sad path to go down. But when I stand upon God's word, that gives me that firm foundation and to proclaim that which I have received. 
right here, forward. And he's, so we need to listen very carefully, and we'll come back to this. There are people out there today that we know would say, Jezebel's right. God doesn't want you to have a rough time. You're saved anyways. Who cares? And we've heard similar things in our culture. All of us have. But look how Jesus Christ responds. He calls this woman Jezebel. So we're going to take a parenthesis right here and say, who was Jezebel? Well, Jezebel was the wife of King Ahab, the most notorious evil king in Israel's history, northern kingdom. There were a lot of bad kings. And in the northern kingdom, there were no good kings, by the way. Every single one of them was bad. But Ahab and Jezebel were the worst of the worst. And really, they became the worst of the worst when he decided, as we read in 1 Kings, to marry Jezebel. And it came to pass, as though it had been a trivial thing for him, that's Ahab, to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So he's already worshipping the true God wrong, and he's getting blasted by the prophet, saying, you say you're worshipping me, but you're doing it contrary to what the Bible says, contrary to what the prophets have now instructed you, you're not really worshipping me. In fact, you're making a mockery of it. But he said, as if that wasn't enough, now you're making no... You're not hiding it. You're worshiping an entirely different God and not even pretending to worship the true God anymore. And you marry this woman, Jezebel. Just as a side note, for those of you guys who like side notes, her name is spelled two different ways in the Bible, um, in the Hebrew, whether you're reading Chronicles or Kings. Because her name was probably something similar to Isabel. Only one said like Isabel, which means like queen of the stars or something like that. It's a, it's, it's a positive thing. And the other one is like I, Isabel, which means they just did a play on words and switched a couple syllables, which means where's the excrement? They didn't like, yeah, you're like, we could say that a little more coarse here this morning, but uh, we won't because we didn't rate the sermon PG-13. So they, they did not like her. And if that made it into the Bible, sometimes it's really fun to read things in the original Latin. So God really didn't like this if he allowed this to make it into Scripture. She was not on his list of faithful people. Well, what happened? She brought Baal worship into Israel. They had had some of that before. But this was a predominant religion in the region. Baal was the thunder god. The, the largely most worshipped one. And he had consorts. And you know what? It was a highly sexualized religion. This false, false worship... And then they would celebrate worship with immorality. It was very common. Like we'd already talked about, shrine prostitutes and immorality of all sorts. So they've not only brought in false religion, they brought, they lowered the moral standards even further of the country when Jezebel came in and basically destroyed the north. Because once she brought this false religion in, Israel struggled with this till the day that they were taken into exile. It would always plague them. And when Elijah confronted her, and it wasn't just that she was kind of offering this as a suggestion. Elijah, the prophet of God, the faithful prophet, went to present himself to Ahab because there was a famine. And this famine was, for so it was, while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord. So the faithful ones, she had been killing off. So you see, this is a serious thing to call this woman in Thyatira Jezebel. She is a false teacher. She is not a believer. She's an outsider who is immoral and now is directly opposed to the things of God. I hope none of you named your daughters Jezebel. If you did, you know, if you're thinking about it though and you haven't, probably want to choose another name. Just thinking. Uh, because he says later on, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And you can see how intertwined they are. She doesn't just have them there, she's hosts them, she brings them in, she feeds them, she takes care of them, care of them, and then she kills the true prophets of God. Not a godly woman. 
And later on, it became so pervasive that Elijah was depressed and thought everyone's following Baal. No one's following God. But God had to remind him, saying, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And while this is a thing of rejoicing that he wasn't alone, you can see just how sick the nation had become. There's a lot more than 7,000 people. For Elijah, this was actually an encouragement, but we can say it's a great discouragement to see how down a nation went with one woman's and her very complicit husband's bad intent. And so we see the same thing in Thyatira. Here's a woman who has come in who is not of God. She speaks as though she was of God. She calls herself a prophetess. And the people have even let her start to speak. But she is not of God. And the judgment is severe. Because he says, I've given her time to repent, but she refuses. And that's put in there for, I think, a couple reasons. Sometimes in this world, we see someone saying some ungodly things, living immoral lifestyles, and we think... They don't, nothing ever happens. They're still blessed. Life still goes on. When we see that in this world, I want us to realize God is a gracious God. And even for this woman that he calls Jezebel, he gave her time. He didn't just come out with a list. He came in and said, I will give you time to repent. And we see this verse here, which I want you to see even as we realize the severity of this judgment. Not that verse. It's on another page. We'll come back. That God is a gracious God, abounding in compassion, even for the most vile offender. But just because God is patient does not mean that these offenses are not severe. And so when we read, unless I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Normally a bed is associated with adultery just in the visual imagery he's saying you may think you're going to a a bed of pleasure you're going into a bed of sickness and there will be severe judgment and everyone who is joining her in this false faith will also be partakers of the judgment unless they repent of their deeds says i will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that i am he who searches the minds and hearts instead of looking at that going that's pretty extreme Now, by children, most of us would say this is probably her followers, spiritual children. But the penalty is very extreme because the offense is very grave, because it is in danger of poisoning the entire body. And we need to know that we are called out of the world. James, in chapter 4, of his his letter says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. He's saying you can't have their gods and the immoral practices and all the sin that you were previously a part of and try to mix it with holiness. And I gave you a very nice illustrations last week. But um, we're not going to go there again. Some of you are like, some of you who weren't here, it had to do with milkshake and phlegm and it was very gross. But... um, But we read in the book of Hosea to the Old Testament when he said the same thing. He says, God has called you to be a faithful spouse. That's kind of the relationship he was saying. And yet you have played the harlot. You've ran after every other God. You've ran after every other way of life. He's saying, it's time for you to come home. And we see that sometimes we try to mix two things you can't mix. In the, uh, in the book of um, 1 Corinthians, let's see here, 2 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 11, Paul is writing to that, that church saying, I'm jealous for you with godly jealousy because I promised you in marriage to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. You see, we're not talking bad jealousy. That's what most of us are good at. But there's an appropriate jealousy, Right? If you knew some people who are married and one of the spouses is being unfaithful and you're like, do you know what your husband's doing? Do you know what your wife's doing? And the person's like, yeah, I don't, I don't really care. You have to be like, what? Because what? we know when something is legitimately yours, like in that divine covenant of marriage, 
there should be an appropriate jealousy. Problem with human beings is we do not do appropriate jealousy. We do sinful jealousy most of the time. But for God, this is entirely appropriate to desire what is rightfully his. The worship of those who said they are his. And the consequences are extreme. And God gives counsel. He says, now to the rest of you, I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. We already, we already talked about, and here's where that verse would pop up, that Jesus Christ calls people to repentance and he's forgiving. And he says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness because God is faithful, he is compassionate. If you've lived a life of sin or you've wandered away you know, either as an unbeliever or have wandered away as a believer, God is there calling all to repentance and willing to receive them and not hold their sins against them. And at that we can take great joy. But repentance is not just acknowledging that I want it's that turn and yielding to Christ and his will and accepting his forgiveness now it's really interesting this I'm just going to mention this here it says those who have not known the depths of Satan this teaching did not go away maybe it did in this church we don't really know the rest of the story the Paul Harvey version of this church but there is later Gnostic teachings that would go off and say well, if you really want to experience God's forgiving, you have to sin to the fullest. What? Yeah, you have to keep sinning. The more you sin, the closer you'll be to God. Huh? Apparently, they did not read this letter to Thyatira to see just how upset God was. And he was obviously being God knew just how bad it would get and how quickly this needed to be stamped down. And he needed to say how unhappy he was with this doctrine. But for those who are faithful, he says, I'm not going to burden you. You're not, you don't need to worry. You're repenting, you're trying to follow God. I'm not in judgment for you. Okay? I'm, I'm loving and compassionate, I want to draw you near. I will put no other burden. It's not for us to sit here and go, is God coming today? Is he going to get me? He's saying, don't, no other burden. God loves you. God desires you to have that relationship with him. But for those who want to oppose God, they get to fly right into the the fierceness and the holiness of our righteous anger. And so we're told to hold fast. And then he gives us this interesting challenge. And him, he who overcomes and keeps my words until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel as all, I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. To this church that is oppressed and beaten down and under the boot of everyone that is around them, he says, you will reign with me in my kingdom. I don't know what that means. I don't. Exactly. Because I have not got my job description yet. I'm thinking it should be something not very, very minor. <laughs> like making sure... Some flower blooms. I don't know. Something that hopefully even I can't mess up. But he is telling you, you know, in in glory, when we receive our new bodies, when our sin is stripped away, God has this reward and these special privileges to give us. We're not going to be just sitting on a cloud playing harps, praise the Lord, because it at least needs to be an electric harp, right? I'm just thinking. But he's got stuff for us to do. Good stuff, glorious stuff, important stuff. And he says, you're not going to be a janitor in heaven. You're going to have authority and acclaim and honor. And these nations which bother you now will not be bothering you anymore. They will be beneath your feet. To him who overcomes. So what about us? Last week we talked at length about compromise and about how we can't do that. We need to move forward, not backward. And, but today, since we already hammered that last week, what we want to see is there's another important thing, and that's going to come in terms of, once again, like we've already talked about, who we listen to. 
who we accept as teachers, who we allow to teach us. Believe me, it's a, it's a very humbling thing to get up here and proclaim God's word week after week because I take it very seriously. I may say some goofy illustrations and talk about my kids a lot, but when you get up and say, thus saith the Lord, that's a look of fear and trembling, honestly. Be, and that's why I want you to read your Bibles, because I, if I ever misspeak and say, well, you know, when Abraham led the people through the Red Sea, like, uh, that was Moses, you know. You can know that and understand, because it's with fear and trembling. I do not want to ever mislead you. And yet there are some people out there that do preach for their own gain. In all denominations, in all religions. And there's false religions on top of that. So we need to be discerning in what we preach. And what we hear. What we, who will you allow to talk to us? And as part of the board and myself as, a, as the chief overseer pastor, we try to be very careful of this pulpit. We don't allow just anyone to come up and give a sermon. Because it matters what you hear. Now you may hear a bad sermon, and I don't mean bad like, well, that was really boring and I went to sleep. Um, You'll have lots of those, I promise you. But you may have a bad sermon that says something about God that we know not to be true. And you need to be aware enough to say, that's not what the Bible says. I can't follow this blindly. And the Bible says a lot about teachers. First of all, in Deuteronomy 13, he warned the Israelites that there would always be false teachers. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you. Even if he's doing signs and wonders and crowds are gathering and he's filling out stadiums and people say, this is the guy. If you look in your Bible and says, that's not right. I have nothing to do with him. For he's testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and hold fast to him. No matter what they, no matter how popular they are, no matter how many books they've written, no matter how many people say this is a great communicator, you've got to hear it. If it doesn't match what's in God's word, have nothing to do with them. In Second Peter, we just read in Jude, which is very similar, and we'll read from Jude as well. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. This is kind of like a summary of the message to Jezebel and Thyatira. And in Jude, verse 4, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men and sometimes women, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That is exactly what was happening in this church. And to their shame, the leadership didn't stand up and say, do not listen to her, but they gave her a platform and they gave her a voice and people were being led astray. You know, we don't make a practice here about publicly, publicly talking about other religions and churches and you know, this guy's bad, this guy's good. First of all, you should be discerning enough to know God's word to be able to figure that out on your own. Okay, we're called to grow. But while I'm not naming names, it's very, it's very hard for me as a pastor. And I, I talk with like Bob Christopoulos and Chris gets to hear me go on rants every once in a while because I'm prone to rants in the office. <clears throat> Where I just look and say, it's killing me. There's people who are from good churches and went to good Bible schools and now what they're preaching is not the gospel. This isn't right. And it breaks my heart, not because I want judgment. What breaks my heart is one, for their own possibility of what they're facing and that responsibility for God, but that other people are listening and saying, this is easier. I like this one. You mean I can have all the good stuff and keep all the bad stuff? No, no. 
And it's, it's, it's dangerous because James 3.1 says, Brothers, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. One of my least favorite verses in the Bible, by the way. But you know what? It's true. Because we have the opportunity as we teach others to influence them for great good or for eternal harm. And Jesus Christ himself said, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. We don't use millstones much anymore, but it's not a little rock. It's about the size of this pulpit. And if this was made of stone, you'd be going quite quite straight down and not coming back up. We need to... um, We need to know what is poisonous and what is good. There are far too many people today in America, and hopefully not here, hopefully none of you, because this is, I'm sure, the good crowd who have not partaken of Satan's deep secrets. But we know out there there's a lot of people who will hear what they want to hear. I remember when I was younger, making big life decisions. Sometimes you ask someone for advice, and you really want advice, but you know already what you want to do, right? Right? And they say, hey, what do you think? And they say, yeah, that's a bad idea. Like, yeah, well, you know what, that, I didn't really try. Hey, what do you think? That's a bad idea. Hey, what do you think? Well, I don't know, maybe. See, I talk to that person and they let me know. That's what some of us do spiritually. We convince in our mind what we want to do and we'll listen and listen until we find someone that agrees what we've already determined to do. Here's a, here's a problem. This is not an opinion book. God lays it out and says, there is one God in all of heaven. There is one Savior for mankind. And all people need to come to repentance, accepting what Jesus Christ did on that cross, what these four people did this morning, professing that they had put their trust in Jesus Christ. And to say, if you believe in your heart that I died for your sins, acknowledge that God raised him from the dead, you can be restored to Jesus Christ. That's not an opinion statement. It's a fact statement. You may not believe it, but it's either you accept it or you reject it. Because this book and Jesus Christ is the only one who claimed to be God in the flesh and a lot of other prophets. But he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So he's either Lord or or he's not, but he didn't give us the alternative of choosing something else. And we need to be willing to stand on those battle lines. We can talk about worship style or what kind of communion bread we're going to use. Please, please don't talk about communion bread. All of you have a different favorite. I really don't want to hear it. <laughs> not because I don't care. I have my own favorite as well. But uh, just because in light of these great things we're facing, we have a lot more important things to worry about. And let's be about him. Let's know God's word. And let us indeed be those people who overcome that when we proceed into eternity, God can say, well done. Well done. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. Thank you so much that you are slow to anger and quick to forgive and abounding, abounding in mercy. And that we can find your mercy. And I pray that you would give us wisdom and would hold us with your own strong hand that we would not stray, against you, stray away from you or sin against you. But that we could stand up in a world that needs people to stand strong and proclaim your holy name. And God, just thank you for today. Thank you for the baptisms and the dedication and people who are serious about following you and have come to know you. And we do ask that you deal with us graciously and mercifully as we stumble along and try and follow. Please strengthen us by your spirit and make us into the people you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.